perfect. I order you to stand in the spotlight and growl at the women like a dog who needs a master. What? Deus Ex is a 2000 immersive sim developed by... Ah, screw it, you know what I'm talking about. It's Deus Ex. It's a damn classic. One of the best games of all time. What, did you expect me to be contrarian? If you want hot takes, this might not be the right channel for you. That being said... Deus Ex Invisible War is not as bad as people. Deus Ex was the brainchild of Warren Spector, who was involved with the creation of Ultima Underworld, which is considered the first example of an immersive sim and the original System Shock. Both classic games in their own right. In his GDC Classic Game Postmortem for Deus Ex, Warren Spector revealed that the idea for Deus Ex came to him while playing Thief the Dark Project. It all started when Warren could not advance through a particular section of a level by sneaking. Fighting the enemies didn't work as well. He tried convincing the designers to make Garrett stronger, which they refused because that would have defeated the entire purpose of the game. He then swore that he'd make a game that would seamlessly combine stealth and combat options in one package. And that's how Deus Ex came to be. Of course, it wasn't that simple, as Warren himself admitted in the presentation. Deus Ex had a rocky development during which the game went through several iterations. The development process was also stunted by numerous project management issues. When two experienced designers applied for the position of lead designer, Warren chose... both. That was a... Uh, that was not a good idea. Neither team accepted being second to the other, so Warren had to name them Design Team 1 and Design Team A. He eventually merged the two teams together and chose Harvey Smith to lead it. Yes, that Harvey Smith. Warren Spector recounts these events fondly, but I can't imagine how stressful the development process must have been for the entire team. Along with the Matrix management structure under which Iron Storm's art team worked, the studio was dealing with tons of bad press and hate mail following the release of Daikatana. The studio quickly adopted a will show them attitude, which might seem romantic and productive in theory, but it only made things worse, as the team had people of varying gaming backgrounds who all wanted elements of their favorite genres implemented in the game. Adding to that was the ambitious scope of the game. I highly recommend reading the game's 1997 design document. And oh boy, let me tell you, it's a... It's a wild ride. It reads like a downright manifesto. It bashes Daggerfall's procedurally generated design and the over-reliance of contemporaneous RPGs on fantasy settings, rigid progression systems and dice rolls. It stresses that RPGs in particular and video games in general need to move on to more realistic settings and focus on reactive gameplay systems that support player agency. I read the entire document in preparation for this video. All 65 pages of it. And I gotta admit it made me yearn for the game Deus Ex could've been. Some of the ideas proposed in this document actually reached the development phase, only to be scrapped. A replica of downtown Dallas, an entire level set in the White House, they created dozens of characters, of which only a handful made the cut. They ditched the modern setting, which was difficult to implement due to technological limitations in favor of a near-future setting. I could make an entire video about the game Deus Ex could've been, but despite all the cuts and the changes, the final product still retains the spirit of the game outlined in that document. An espionage cyberpunk immersive sim that, even today, is unequaled in terms of emergent gameplay and design. There he is! There he is! Billy! Deus Ex takes place in 2052, in an alternate timeline where the craziest conspiracy theories you could think of are real. Black helicopters, grey aliens, men in black, the Chupacabra, and Deus Ex, real-world speculations about the Illuminati, the Knights Templar, Majestic 12 and the Trilateral Commission are true as all of these organizations have at some point in history ruled the world from the shadows. On top of this clusterfuck of shady organizations, the world is ravaged by a deadly plague known as the Great Death. <sighs> Why am I doing this to myself? The plague is caused by a nanovirus that affects people who lack a predisposition for nano-augmentations. 
So basically almost everybody. When someone is infected, the nanites attach themselves to the person's cells, causing the body to reject both the nanites and the cells. The infection causes flu-like symptoms in its early stages, and as the illness progresses, the patient turns pale grey and becomes increasingly frail until they inevitably die. The illness is incurable and can only be halted by a vaccine called ambrosia. Unfortunately, the vaccine is in short supply and it's distributed mainly to the political and intellectual elite leaving the general population to die by the hundreds of thousands. Naturally, the game's depiction of society in 2052 is not very optimistic. The majority of people who have no economic prospects on account of the virus affecting every possible aspect of society live in miserable ghettos, falling victim to drug abuse, gang violence, governmental oppression, or a combination thereof. Those that haven't have formed resistance movements in opposition to the increasingly totalitarian governments. Texas has seceded from the United States, leading to a bloody civil war. India and Pakistan have obliterated each other in a brief but devastating exchange of nuclear bombs. In Deus Ex, everything that could have gone wrong, went wrong. But what makes Deus Ex's dystopia so palpable are the specifics how it depicts daily life in this miserable timeline. Like public services shutting down due to widespread riots and sabotage, or local authorities having to order mass graves in Brooklyn because riots and traffic jams have made organized cleanup efforts impossible. My favorite piece of flavor text is one that I'm sure many people missed. While exploring the town hotel in Hell's Kitchen, I found a pamphlet advertising an end of the world party. It calls out the rich that fled the city in droves as soon as shit hit the fan, and compares the current social and political situation to, get this, a classic 1990s Michael Bay action flick. Prospective attendants are then encouraged to scrounge up as much food and drugs as possible and then lock the doors. And honestly, who can blame them? If I were to live in a world as bleak and oppressive as the one depicted in Deus Ex, I don't know if I'd ever be sober. Good for them, man. I really hope the cops didn't crash their party. I don't know who wrote this, but in case you're watching this video, and let's be real, you won't. I wanna thank and congratulate you for this wonderful piece of flavor text. It encapsulates the vibe of this game so well. And also, you gave me enough material to fill up like 30 seconds of this video, so yeah. Thanks for that. The story of Deus Ex centers on J.C. Denton, a fresh out of the Academy agent of the newly founded UNATCO, a branch of the United Nations created to combat the growing threat of international terrorism. J.C. Denton is the first in a new line of agents who are physically altered with nano-augmentations. Notice how I said nano-augmentations instead of mechanical augmentations. In Deus Ex, mechanical augmentations are regarded as passé, to put it politely. They're seen as crude, barbaric, and aesthetically unpleasant. Nano augmentations, on the other hand, are the hottest shit in town due to their unobtrusive nature. You inject those bad boys into your body or, I don't know, something and you get superpowers. What's interesting here is the awkward dynamic this creates between mechanically augmented and nano augmented UNATCO agents, a subject which the game touches on repeatedly throughout the story. Mechanically augmented agents who have literally sacrificed their bodies in the name of increased efficiency in the field feel like hulks of metal in comparison to their colleagues and their fancy nano augmentations. And despite all the UNATCO leaflets and handbooks praising the agents who have mangled their bodies in the name of world peace, it's clear they're planning to steadily phase them out. The reason I'm spending so much time on this is that this is the kind of stuff that makes a fictional world believable. Not the major geopolitical events and the batshit factions orchestrating them from the shadows, but the small details that contextualize the larger world. I wanna know how the social and political turmoil affects the average person. I want to know the day-to-day -day realities of living in an oppressive society with such low regard for human life. And Deus Ex answers all of these questions, and then some. What's even more impressive is how Deus Ex managed to depict its dystopia in such vivid detail across multiple locations. You get to see flavors of the same shitty world, but from the lens of the culture dominating the place you're in. The game starts in New York. Imagine the most depressing pop culture rendition of New York in the 70s, add cyberpunk technology and multiply it by a thousand and you get the Ex's version of New York. Then you get to Hong Kong, which is slightly better off than New York, but it's still a shithole plagued by poverty and gang violence perpetrated by the triads. Then there's Paris. I absolutely adore this level. The vestiges of its bohemian culture are everywhere. 
nightclubs, cafes, bookstores, all in various states of disrepair because the city is under martial law. Even its national terrorist organization is formed mostly of hipsters, who'd much rather hijack and bombard public broadcasting channels with revolutionary messages and memes than pick up a gun. I just realized that I barely touched on the major organizations that shape the world Deus Ex takes place in, namely the Illuminati and the Knights Templar. There is some interesting stuff here as well, like how the Knights Templar weren't actually eradicated, it was a plot orchestrated by the Knights Templar so that they could disappear from the public eye and lay the foundations of the modern Swiss banking system, or how the Illuminati surreptitiously nurtured and promoted all the conspiracy theories surrounding them to mask their actual machinations. I can help but make a connection to the KGB's approach to the conspiracy theories which accused them of assassinating JFK. Assassinating the President of the United States made absolutely no sense from a strategic standpoint for the USSR, but the prospect of them pulling off such a feat made them look good. So while they denied it publicly, they did everything in their power to ensure that theory remained in the public consciousness. So the KGB basically mobilized a large part of their propaganda apparatus to promote a ludicrous conspiracy theory just for flexing purposes. Fascinating stuff. Anyway, you get the idea. Deus Ex has one of the most well-crafted game worlds I've ever experienced and I haven't even touched on the plot and the finer details of its world building. It has that global catastrophe next door vibe to it in the sense that what you see in Deus Ex could potentially happen in the real world if we're not careful enough. Now as for the presentation, I don't have much to say about it. Deus Ex wasn't a looker even by early 2000s standards and it certainly didn't age well. Fortunately, its presentation quirks do verge more towards endearing than immersion breaking. For example, the breathing animations are comical. <laughs> they, they look like they're engaged in an eternal shrugathon with each other. Sometimes the sounds your feet make don't correspond with the surface you're running or walking on. All enemies have the same death sounds. Some character models are recycled too often, sometimes in the same level. I've seen this bartender in three separate locations, two of them in Hong Kong. By the way, I don't know what's up with the bartenders in this game, but they sure like to talk politics and philosophy. You said outside influences. What does China fear? China is the last sovereign country in the world. Authoritarian but willing, unlike UN governed countries, to give its people the freedom to do what they want. As long as they don't break the law. Listen to me. This is real freedom. Freedom to own property, make a profit, make your life. The West so afraid of strong government, now has no government, only financial power. Our governments have limited power by design. Rhetoric? You believe it? Don't you know where these slogans come from? I give up. Well paid researchers. How do you say it? Think tanks? Man, the deepest conversation I've ever had with a bartender was about whether it's a good idea to drop my Agrameister shot in a pint of beer and chug it. Since I don't remember the aftermath, it's safe to assume I did it. Mom, if you're watching this, let's be real, you probably won't. I'm sorry. There was one small detail that caught my attention. I had just entered the Versalife HQ in Hong Kong and while doing my rounds I looked out the window out of curiosity and I actually saw NPCs on street level doing their thing. It just blew my mind that they bothered to make the outside world persistent even when you're inside self-contained areas. I also love that when you get your feet blown off JC starts crawling. It's ridiculous, but it's a nice detail. Oh, and when you place obstacles in front of NPCs, they'll struggle for a bit and then just break through them. I'm not sure they actually programmed this or if it's a result of the emergent mechanics though. I'm glad it exists nonetheless. I was in two minds about this, but I feel like I'm obligated to at least mention Deus Ex's voice acting. It's one of those aspects that went on to define this game. No games. We would like another ally like Paul. The tryouts are at war thanks to a woman named Maggie Chow. Mr. J.C. Denton, in the fresh. Both the Illuminati and MJ-12 believe that the most intelligent or enlightened human being will inevitably gain power, ultimately seizing the eye in the pyramid and creating the world for everyone else. Kind of secularized version of natural law. 
I'm physically struggling not to focus so much on its presentation problems given the small size of the team that worked on this game. A team of 20 people was small even by 2000 standards. The fact that they managed to release this game in a stable and bug free state is a small miracle, especially since it didn't have the smoothest of development cycles. If anything I grow fonder of these quirks with each passing year. Deus Ex reminded me why I love analyzing these old games so much. They were created in certain conditions that can't be replicated today. Anyway, to wrap up these sections, Deus Ex might not hold up so well in the presentation department, but it's still a masterclass in world building. So let's move on to the gameplay. Hush, hush. The very first thing you do in Deus Ex is skill allocation. Looking at the screen, you might think Deus Ex is an RPG. And you'd be partially right, but there is more to this system than meets the eye. Broadly speaking, the skills can be classified in two categories, combat and environmental. You got your combat skills which determine your efficiency with melee weapons and firearms, and the environmental skills which affect the way you interact with the, well, environment. Don't expect to use all of these skills during a single playthrough. The game gives you just enough skill points to specialize in two, maybe three skills. Certain ones like environmental protection and swimming are downright useless, so don't waste your precious points on them. For new players I recommend picking up one level of electronics, lockpicking and computers. This setup should cover all of your early game needs. Melee you can make do without investing anything into it. Melee is relevant only early, and as you'll progress through the game you'll become more and more reliant on firearms. So how do skills work in practice? Well, the more points you invest into a given skill, the more resource efficient JC becomes. Say I wanna hack this panel. To do that I need to use free multi-tools, which are consumable resources. But if I upgrade my electronic skill from train to advanced, the requirement is lower to two multi-tools. The same principle applies to lockpicking. Computer allows you to hack into terminals and computers. Whenever you access a computer uh, clandestinely, a countdown bar will pop up. Once it expires, JC gets shocked and the alarm is triggered. The more skilled you become in computers, the faster you'll be able to hack terminals, which in turn will give you more time to sift through emails, turn off cameras, open locked doors and so on and so forth. Because terminals have no skill requirements and you can usually obtain the login credentials from multiple sources, in my opinion one level of computer is more than enough to cover all of your needs. If you're not a fast reader, just screenshot the email and you'll be fine. As a side note, I love that you can copy paste passwords and usernames. Combat is a bit trickier in this game, and it's also where Deus Ex's RPG roots are the most apparent. Weapon related skills such as pistol and rifle influence not only how much damage JC the but also his proficiency with those weapons. JC's level of experience is indicated by a dynamic reticle. For maximum accuracy and damage, you have to wait for it to shrink. The more points you have invested in its respective branch, the faster it shrinks. Speaking of which, the combat in this game is… not good. It's Deus Ex's weakest aspect. If I were to choose one reason why the combat doesn't work, I'd say it's a combination of weak weapon design and atrocious AI. The weapons, with the exception of the sniper rifle, have this toy gun feel to them. They just feel bad to use regardless of how proficient you are. Now the AI, oh boy. Inconsistent is putting it politely. The AI is a mixture of brain dead stupid and hyper alert. I can tase a guard without inciting so much as a side glimpse from his buddy sitting right next to him, but god forbid I try to lockpick a supply cabinet on the second story of an apartment block without alerting the guards from across the fucking boulevard. This was not an isolated incident by the way. I don't know what part of their training gives these guards the uncanny ability to hear lockpicks from a mile away, but I really wanna see a brochure. The inconsistent AI can also make stealth playthroughs tedious and unengaging. Few things are more frustrating than having your no-kill ghost run ruined by inconsistent enemy behavior. My advice, take a stealthy, non-lethal approach only during the first three levels because there is a story and mechanical incentive to do so. After that it's just not worth the fuss, at least in my opinion. Augmentations add a whole other layer of customization and choice. You can alter pretty much any part of your body with augs that will influence how you interact with the world and solve objectives. From spy drones to scout ahead, lung augments that allow you to breathe longer underwater, to cloaking nanites that alter the very structure of your skin layers and make you invisible to enemies. What's interesting is that 
that the game offers two options for any body part and they're mutually exclusive. Take the first augmentation canister you receive in the game. While both options alter your arms functionally, they serve entirely different purposes. One increases the damage you deal with melee weapons, the other allows you to lift heavy objects. So what do you choose here? Well, it's all up to you and how you want to play the game. I always go with microfibril... microfibril muscle, because I like creating unorthodox paths through levels. Not all augments are created equal though. While you can mix and match augs and create some pretty big brain synergies, some augs just suffer from a redundancy problem. There's an aug for your torso called environmental resistance, which decreases the damage and effects from toxins. You don't need it. If you upgrade regeneration to say level 2, you can safely tank all types of environmental damage. The list of head scratchers doesn't end here. See, all augmentations are active abilities that require energy to function. This is fine and all and makes sense until you find a torso augmentation called power recirculator. As the name implies, it decreases the energy usage of all active augmentations. And it's an active ability. So, to decrease the energy usage of your augments, you have to activate a separate augment which, in turn, consumes energy. There's no reason why this could not have been a passive ability. I'm assuming it's a deliberate decision taken for balancing purposes rather than a design oversight, but even so, that doesn't make it less ridiculous. Now, the beauty of Deus Ex is that if you don't want to engage with the systems I've been describing for the last uh, 6 hours, you can safely ignore them and still beat the game. Think the skill system is stupid? Well, don't use it bro, you'll be fine. Wanna waste the millions of dollars you netco invested in your training and the technology that places you in the top 1% of your agency? Dump those canisters in the trash can, augments are for nerds anyway. As much as I love Arx Fatalis, Dishonored, Prey and other immersive sim classics, none have managed to capture the magic of Deus Ex's immersive simulation. Think of a way to complete an objective, overcome an obstacle or traverse a location and the designers have accounted for that. From the very first mission, the game emphasizes that there are multiple ways to accomplish your objectives. Let's take the first mission as an example. Your goal is to infiltrate the statue of Liberty, which has been occupied by NSF, which is a terrorist organization, and captured an interrogator leader. So what are your options here? You can hack a terminal and open the front door, get a nano key via a side mission and unlock it the old fashioned way, or create a back entrance through some creative crate manipulation. Both entrances have advantages and disadvantages. Going through the main door comes with the obvious drawback of, well, entering a heavily guarded building through the main door, but it connects directly to a secondary objective. The back entrance is less guarded, but you have to deal with traps and NSF officers, which are tougher and deadlier than the standard troopers. Now let's circle back to the side objective, which has you save a fellow UNATCO agent held prisoner in the basement. The entrance was wired with booby traps, so I accessed the vent nearby. The vent connected to a room with a locked door, but lockpicks are hard to come by, so I didn't want to use one. But then I thought, hey, didn't I find a multi-tool in the vent earlier? As it turns out, yeah, I did. So I used it to bypass the traps, incapacitated all the guards and freed my colleague. By the way, why Gunther had a wine bottle in his cell is beyond me. Let me give you another example. In the fourth mission, I was to infiltrate the secret NSF hideout in New York City's dilapidated metro system. I could either hack the keypad and unlock the secret entrance, do a side quest and obtain the code from the quest giver, or find it in a datapad hidden behind the panel. What's great is that these options are unlocked organically, as you explore the environment and interact with people. At the beginning of the second mission, a kid asked me for a candy bar and I offered him one without thinking twice about it. And then he just gave me a code to a secret path that led right to the location I was to infiltrate. Missions, levels, gadgets and really all the mechanics are designed with player choice in mind. Sure JC is his own character and there's not much players can do in the way of shaping his personality, but they have full control over how he accomplishes his goals. At no point does the game suggest that one solution is better than the other. The player is in charge of creating their experience. The designers are there just to give them the necessary tools to do so. And it really feels empowering when you think outside the box and come up with a creative solution. I played this game 10 times over the years, and for some reason it never occurred to me to throw scrambler grenades and pit robots against each other until this playthrough. I'm the worst kind of person to play immersive sims because I always instinctively play by the rules, even when there are no rules to speak of. If the game says that I need to lockpick a door to open it, I'm gonna lockpick it, no questions asked. And then it hit me. 
These doors have damaged thresholds. That means they can be destroyed. So what happens if I place a lamb on a door and shoot it? So I did just that. And it worked. From that point on, I rarely if ever used lockpicks if I had explosives in my inventory. See these chests? Why use four lockpicks when they're uh, perfectly explodable? Similarly, my first impulse was to bribe this guy to obtain a security pass to Versalife's laboratory facility. The price was astronomical, so I put a pin on his offer. There had to be a better way that didn't require me to spend literally all of my money for a one-time usage item. And what do you know, one of his employees offered to let me in for free if I killed his boss. And just like that I saved up 2000 credits and neutralized the layer of corrupt middle management. Neat. I'm running out of ways to express the sheer amount of choices this game offers, both intended by the designers and emergent. I mentioned in my arcane video that I'm too stupid for immersive sims, and I meant it. Like, I saw a video of someone accessing Maggie Chow's apartment by improvising a makeshift ladder by planting landmines on the exterior wall of the building. Meanwhile, I moved a few crates and entered Paul's apartment through the fire escape instead of the front door and I felt super smart. What glues all of these systems together is the reactivity of the plot to your actions. I took a non-lethal approach in the first three missions and my brother, always the pacifist, commended me for it. My boss berated me for going into the ladies restroom. I saw a sign in a bar that read no weapons allowed beyond this point and what do you know, they were not joking. Still not impressed? Well, if you kill a major character before a certain story trigger, you remove them as a boss fight later and the plot adapts to it. You even get special dialogue lines written specifically in the event players might do this. I knew about this ahead of time so I got creative and planted mines along the corridor they were supposed to spawn in. Fun stuff. Now the last thing I want to talk about is the map design. If you've been following my channel for long enough, you might already know that I'm a huge fan and advocate of hub-based world design, meaning one smallish central zone that connects to adjacent areas, which in turn loop back to the starting location. Deus Ex was the game that converted me to this design school of thought, many, many, many years ago, way before I even had a chance to become bored with open world games. I wouldn't necessarily call Deus Ex's level small, I think dense semi-open-ended would be more accurate. Interestingly, their maze-like layouts and verticality make them seem bigger than they actually are. Some hubs like Hong Kong have a truly rabbit hole feel to them. You go down a path and you don't know where the hell you're gonna end up. I found a freezer in the back of a dive bar, entered a vent, crawled through it for a couple of minutes, jumped into water, swam for another 5 minutes or so, and I ended up in a tunnel which had collapsed due to flooding. This is some Rube Goldberg-esque urban planning, dude. The way Deus Ex approached in-game exploration 20 years ago is still unequaled, in my opinion. If you like finding secrets in games, Deus Ex is for you. It strikes a perfect balance between right under your nose, but still requiring players to pay attention to the environment, if that makes any sense. A key squeezed between a wall and a fence, a stairway leading into the water, they're so satisfying to find. And if that wasn't enough, the game also rewards you with a dopamine hit in the form of a small exploration bonus. Deus Ex also does a great job telegraphing its secrets. So I saw a small crate right next to a bigger one. I placed the crate down, climbed on top of the shelf, grabbed the energy cell, hopped on a balance beam, looked to my left and hey, hidden loot. I don't know if I've ever told this story before, but back when I was a kid, I was a bit of an explorer. This is the park I used to play in. Well, what survived of it? The local authorities raised most of it in 2004 to build a cathedral that, as of 2021, is still in construction. Anyway, I remember it had these large sprawling green mazes. I spent hours of my summer vacations exploring them and creating secret pathways through the bushes that only I knew of. I also recall begging my grandpa for a year to build a crawl space or a secret wall compartment in my room. I don't know, the idea of having a cool little secret place just for me where I could store shit like magazines, toys and candy seemed so cool to me. I remember envying those kids in American movies and their tree houses and shit so much. I know it's a stupid story, but hey, it was just a phase. Dude, I want a secret compartment in my living room so much. So why did I tell you this story? 
Well, Deus Ex is the closest thing I can get to that childhood experience of exploring every nook and cranny and using my creativity to create my own paths. Whenever I boost myself up with some crates and find some sweet loot, I get the same fuzzy feeling I used to get whenever my grandpa let me explore our attic. I know it sounds corny, but hey, that's just how I feel. I love Deus Ex and I hope this video will convince you to give it a shot, even though it looks ugly and it's old enough to drive at this point. That's gonna be it for today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.